In this video we want to talk about barriers to entry. Now what we mean by barriers to entry uh, can be described as a situation where let's say a new business which is to enter a particular market, which is to sell a product in an existing mar in, in a market, but where there are existing firms, there are existing producers producing similar products. Now the, the companies in the market, the ones that exist in the market, may want to block the new entry. And they may want to block it because they want to preserve their profits. They don't want competition. And to block it, they may use a variety of barriers to entry. And that's the subject matter of this video. That's what we want to talk about. The types of barriers to entry that we can imagine or we can conceive of. First of all, let's talk about profits. Well, <coughs> in economics, in the literature in economics, on the theory of the firm as it's called, there are two types of profit we can uh, distill from that literature. One is called normal profit and the second is abnormal profit. Now normal profit is simply that amount of profit that enables the business to continue in existence. It's, it just keeps the business going. It just enables the business to maintain its presence in the market. Whereas abnormal profits which are also, by the way, called excessive profits or excess profits or supernormal profits. But abnormal profits, as uh, the slide here says, abnormal profits are profits that, profits that are over and above that necessary to keep the company in that line of business. In other words, when the company is making profits over and above that necessary to keep it producing, to keep it in that line of work, then we call those abnormal profits. So we don't use quantitative measures. We don't say uh, a lot of profits. Uh, abnormal profits are lots and lots of profits. Uh, that doesn't mean very much. But abnormal profits has got a particular meaning. It means that the company is making more profit than necessary to keep it in that line of business. But if a company is making abnormal profits this will be a signal to other companies to enter the market. Now this of course depends on whether the other companies know that the company is making abnormal profits. So sometimes the companies may try to hide their profits but if other companies know that a, a business is doing really well and making abnormal profits then they will want to join in to try and get some of those abnormal profits for themselves. So it's profit that is the incentive, according to this view, to set up in business. And the companies that are in production will want to preserve their profitability by placing barriers to entry against potential entrants. Now we may note examples of this form from our everyday experience. Uh, let's say when a fast food outlet opens in a locality it may become popular and earn abnormal profits. A lot of people may go to it, they may like the food, it's a fast food outlet, uh, people like it, it's convenient, it's, they, they consider it to be good quality, value for money, so it becomes very popular and the, the business flourishes. But of course other potential producers will see this. They will see the company prospering and they will want to emulate that. They will want to set up with a similar type of product because they want to, they don't want to take the risk of introducing a new product which may fail. So they will try to copy a successful product. They'll, they'll try to copy the one that's currently making the abnormal profits. So it will encourage more fast for, uh, food outlets to open in that locality. The original outlet could stop them from entering, or if it could I should say, then it would. That's if, if they could stop them they would, because they want to enjoy abnormal profits. 
However, it's difficult to stop competition uh, in this industry. So there are lots of models in economics, in microeconomics, that <coughs> deals with this issue. For example, uh, the model on monopolistic competition, which is the subject matter of a different video. Uh, in that case, the companies make essentially the same product, just slightly differentiated, slightly different one from the next. And they're in competition. They're in competition, but really they're making slightly different products. Well, the idea is that they want to try and preserve their profitability. They want to stop competition if they can. If they can come into the market, we say the market is contestable. In the case we've, we've got here on the slide of um, a fast food outlet that opens and becomes very profitable, very uh, popular and profitable, uh, then that will encourage other producers to set up in that area producing similar products. And the fact that they can set up means that the market is contestable. They can contest the market. Depending on the nature of the business, barriers to entry of new firms may be placed against them. So in some businesses it may be possible to have barriers to entry, ways of blocking potential entrance, ways of stopping new competition from happening. If the barriers to entry are successful then the existing firms may expect to continue to make, let's say, abnormal profits. So if they're successful in blocking entry, then the successful firms in the market will continue to earn abnormal profits. In this case, of course, the profit incentive has been cancelled and the market is not effectively allocating resources to satisfy con uh, consumer wants. The whole idea of the market is that profits act as a signal to producers to allocate resources when, uh, when, when companies are very successful in a given area it attracts competition. But of course if the companies that are making the abnormal profits can stop the other companies coming in in effect they're stopping the market from working. The whole idea of profitability is that it's a signal it's a signal to producers to produce more to start new businesses and make similar products and and com competition should flourish thereby the price will fall as far as the consumer is concerned consumer will get better treatment better quality good cheaper prices the market would be working but if barriers to entry can be implemented can be used to stop entry then of course <coughs> the market is not working the market has been cancelled the profit motive regulates the supply on the market and for this reason barriers to entry are generally seen as not desirable. Uh, the amount of goods on the market, the, the amount of products on the market is really a reflection of the perceived profitability of those markets perceived by the entrepreneurs and the business people who are placing the products on the market. They're only placing them on the market so that they can make a profit. So they don't want um, barriers to entry. They don't want to be stopped from making that profit. And indeed, the customers don't want them to be stopped. The customers want to see competition because it's in the customer's interest that there should be lower prices, better quality, more innovation, more change. Barriers to entry are used to maintain abnormal profits in the long run. That's the whole idea. The barriers to entry are try is an effort on the part of producers to try to maintain abnormal profits in the long run. Where there are no barriers to entry, we say that the market is contestable. So if there are barriers to entry, it's not contestable. If there are no barriers to entry, it is contestable. Now this idea of abnormal profits, just, just uh, reinforce what we've been saying. 
Well, these are profits over and above that necessary to maintain a firm in the industry. In other words, if the company made less, he would still produce. The fact that it's making more means it's earning abnormal profits. And that's our, our definition of abnormal profits. Normal profits are profits that are only sufficient to maintain the firm in the industry. Any lower levels of profit and the firm would leave the industry. So normal profits is when the, the firm is just making enough to keep it going. Now one way of differentiating products, to talk about the ways in which product differentiation can um, can be used, one way to do it is to have product differentiation, to make different products. In other words, the companies could copy almost the essence of the successful product, copy the design, copy the price, copy the quality, but make some variations, make some changes to it thereby offering a slightly different product. Essentially the same but it's, it introduces this concept of product differentiation. And as I said the model in economics here that's best suited to this one is monopolistic competition. Now there are two types of product differentiation. First of all what we would call psychic differentiation. This means that the consumers believe that there is a difference between the products in the market, when in fact the products are essentially homogeneous. They're essentially all the same. But people believe they're different. Um, this happens uh, with many products in, in practice. Uh, electricity has to be supplied with certain characteristics, a certain voltage, and um, so electricity is homogeneous in terms of the supply of electricity, and yet different suppliers charge different prices. And that may be because of ignorance on the part of the consumer who don't know what the prayer's prices are, or uh, laziness, they don't want to simply change, or they believe that some companies are producing a better service and are more reliable. There's a psychic differentiation. They believe that certain companies are very good, when in fact they're producing exactly the same product or selling the same product as as other uh, suppliers. So psychic differentiation could sometimes be related to advertising. Uh, it's building up loyalty in, in the minds of the, the people, and we'll talk about this later, but it's building up loyalty in the minds of the, the consumers. The people are, are starting to recognize this company as special, having very high quality and very big and reputable names, so it's got a, a psychic advantage. It's, it's in people's minds, and they've differentiated their product by doing this. So they might do it by repetitive advertising for example or high quality advertising in quality magazines. There's also physical differentiation. This is when the products are physically different and it is obvious to the uh, consumer that the products are different. It may involve things like um, style changes or packaging or service agreements but there are differences in the product and thereby uh, there are ways in which uh, companies may differentiate their product to try and get into a market, uh, to try to make their product slightly different. Uh, the existing companies in the market may use repetitive advertising to gain a psychic advantage by creating consumer loyalty, perhaps to the brand. They, they believe that the brand is uh, a special quality, a special image. So the existing companies may try to protect themselves by psychic differentiation whereas the companies coming in may slightly differentiate the product to try and get a foothold in the market. 
<clears throat> by the way the existing companies in the market may also physically differentiate their own product to try and stop entry uh, the detergent market is a good example where there are only uh, a limited number of suppliers Lever Brothers, Procter & Gamble come to mind uh, yet if we go to supermarkets we will observe many many different types of detergent and the reason for that is that each company produces many different brands so that if a competitor was to enter the market they would be facing many brands they would be in competition with many different brands of detergent not two because there are two companies but many and that will deter potential entrance. Advertising <coughs> is a very powerful way of putting up a barrier to entry. As I said earlier with psychic differentiation it, it builds up a product loyalty. It may be achieved through effective advertising. This means that customers are willing to purchase the good even though there are cheaper and better goods on the market. So customers simply build up a loyalty to certain goods and they have a certain lifestyle in a certain way and the advertising industry bolsters that. The advertising industry reinforces it. So there are there is product loyalty and if there is product loyalty then new entrants into the market will find it difficult to get in because the consumers are resistant towards different products or uh, different names there are two types of advertising there is persuasive advertising this is usually repetitive in nature it's persuasive they're trying to persuade people to buy it attempts to alter our preferences in favor of the product it attempts to create fashions and persuade us that the product will enhance our images so this is relying on image it relies on uh, our perception of the product it, it persuades us that this product is superior it's this product is desirable and the advertisements are normally very well worked out and uh, delivered with the right time the right time of day uh, to the right market uh, they suggest a certain lifestyle a certain quality of life and they pr they persuade the um, the customers to buy that product the second type is informative advertising this is generally less attractive um, than persuasive advertising the, the advertisements are not as interesting as this persuasive advertising will have nice music and nice imagery and it'll suggest perhaps a certain lifestyle associated with the product whereas informative advertising will tell us about the product it'll tell us about the price of the product uh, the attributes of the product uh, the the workings of the product it's very factual we see it for example with car ad, uh, advertisements uh, a car advertisement will, will probably show some people driving around uh, the city and all smiles and laughing and having a good time at least that's what it would suggest and because of that we want to empathize we want to go and have a good time as well so we want to buy that car at least that appears to be the logic in that type of advertising Ad, uh, per, uh, informative advertising related to the same car would tell us about the miles per gallon or the miles per litre or the kilometres per litre it'll tell us about oil usage and uh, the power of the engine and uh, about the warranty and it'll talk about the car but we don't see that type of advertising uh, cars do not include adver uh, advertisements for cars do not include that so we have this two types of, of advertising persuasive and informative um, there are also technological barriers for example specialization um, machines some production processes require uh, specialized machinery 
it may be difficult for new entrants to acquire that technology. It may be difficult for them to start production because they can't get the, the proper equipment because perhaps it's too expensive or perhaps also the suppliers of that equipment have a special relationship with the existing companies and are reticent to supply a new competitor because they don't want to alienate their existing customers. There's also skills. Uh, labour shortages of specialised nature may act as a, a barrier to entry of new firms into the industry. Sometimes to make products requires special talents on the part of the workforce. Well, presumably the existing companies in the market will already have taken the, the skilled workers. Those companies will have uh, taken the skilled workers, uh, further trained them and built up a loyalty amongst those particular workers. So it's very difficult for a new company to acquire workers with the appropriate skills to start production. There's also product design, ingredients and composition. If the product is made from some obscure compound or if the design or the ingredients are difficult to copy then this will act as, as a barrier to entry. It depends on the nature of the product. If it's, if it's easy to produce there's more likelihood of the companies being able to set up and start production. But if the product is complicated or it has some obscure chemical formulation or it, it's difficult to get the ingredients, it's difficult to make this particular product, then that will be a barrier to entry and the companies will find it difficult to enter that market. Capital is also a problem. A shortage of capital will act as a barrier to entry. If a potential entrant cannot raise the funds to set up in business, then this is an, op an obstacle or barrier. Banks may, may be reluctant to lend to a new business. Um, so it's difficult for a new business to, to start. It knows perhaps it can produce and get entry into the market and, and uh, sell the product, but it just can't start because it doesn't have the capital. And it finds it difficult to acquire that capital. As I said, skills. A labour shortage may mean that a potential entrant cannot get the skilled workers necessary to start up in business. Perhaps the particular business requires very specialised skills. So not just the general skills I mentioned earlier, but now very specialised skills. Perhaps uh, uh, skills which uh, means that the the staff would have to be very highly qualified. It's very difficult to attract those those people. And if it was possible to attract them, they would probably command premium pay rates. Again, all acting as barriers to entry, barriers to start-up. There are also legal and patents and copyright issues that, that can stop companies from starting up in business. Inventors and innovators are given a period during which competition is not allowed. This is a reward for them to, for being inventors and innovators. Because they've come up with a good idea, um, it's felt that they should benefit from the returns on that good idea for a number of years. So everyone has to wait until the legal protection runs out. When the legal protection runs out, then they may start uh, competition. They, they may start up against uh, the companies. So legal or patents or copyright uh, restrictions may act as a barrier to entry. It's an, to enable them, as I said, to reap the rewards of their inventiveness. Uh, the production of certain non-dangerous goods is also controlled. Uh, this is not a, a patent, but uh, <clears throat> the production certainly of dangerous goods is controlled. For example, explosives. Companies just can't set up in business making explosives. 
uh, it's too dangerous and it has to be regulated by by the authorities by by the police and by by the government and quite rightly too because we don't want to just people setting up making making explosives uh, it's dangerous but <coughs> Non-dangerous goods uh, could also be controlled. Some may be controlled. Um, items, for example, which uh, are not immediately seen as dangerous, not in the short term. For example, um, cigarettes. Now, we know that cigarettes are dangerous, but uh, it takes a number of years before uh, people suffer the effects of smoking. But that may, be, that may act as a, as a barrier to entry and official campaigns against certain types of production uh, sponsored by the governments and by consumer groups may act as a, a barrier to entry to companies thinking of getting involved in those markets. Um, but certain items, non-dangerous items, um, the example we've got here is uh, also paper money and coinage uh, this is produced under very restricted conditions. Some companies are given the right to produce money. These are called the mint. Now the mint can make uh, coinage. Uh, they're legally entitled to do it but under very strict conditions and obviously very close monitoring of the amount they're making. Now if anyone else tries to make money that's called counterfeit and that's illegal. So people may have a good idea which they think is a good commercial idea to start printing money um, but it's illegal. Um, only the government and the monetary authorities of the country are allowed to print money and to regulate the money supply. And that's in all our interest so that we have uh, an economy which runs properly, it runs effectively. Back to dangerous goods again, well the government prohibits competition in certain dangerous goods. Um, the production of certain non-dangerous goods is also controlled. Uh, for example, as I said, paper money, uh, that's got a very restricted um, set of conditions associated with it. And as I said also with the dangerous goods um, explosives and certain types of drugs. Uh, in other words, uh, anything which could constitute a danger to the public, gov the governments will prohibit uh, the production of those items. So uh, dangerous chemicals, explosives and, and so on, they will be regulated. It's also the case that companies may have to gain planning permission if they're going to set up in business. Before a new plant can come online it must be constructed. The government may wish to prohibit construction in certain areas or it may wish to deter a certain type of production altogether. For example nuclear waste processing. So companies may know that that is very profitable business to be in but they just can't get an area in which they can do their work. The government may stop them from working in certain areas or may control how those companies operate. So there is very tight planning permission on the production of some items. We don't have to consider the extremes of uh, nuclear waste processing. It could be uh, a company that's making drop forgings, which is a very noisy thing to have to make. Um, these are metal forgings uh, which have to be hammered out. Well, the companies may, uh, sorry, the government may wish to stop companies from opening such plants in the middle of the city where it's very noisy and polluting the atmosphere and causing traffic chaos and and making a lot of noise. So the location of companies will be regulated as well and that can constitute a barrier to entry. Uh, raw materials. <coughs> well access to the source of raw materials is essential before production may commence. Uh, the company must be able to get their hands on 
raw materials. They must be able to find a supply of raw materials. If they can't get the raw materials, the business can't start up. Now the control of the source of raw materials is there, therefore confers power on those who possess it. Now it could be that the existing companies who are producing this particular product control the, the source of raw materials as well. They have secured their own supplies. In, the, in, in so doing, of course, they are blocking potential entrants. They are blocking new companies from coming into the market. So a potential entrant needs to be sure of the source of raw materials before they start uh, the company. There's no point in investing in the premises and the capital and the machinery and, and then find that they can't get the raw materials. Now the threat of competition is also seen as a barrier to entry. And this may seem a slightly obscure one, but it can be real enough as well. Let's assume that there is a, a very highly successful producer who is earning abnormal profits. Now, take this particular scenario. So there's a producer who's making a lot of profit, making abnormal profits. And let's call this producer A. Now assume that a potential entrant comes on the scene. So now this company, this producer A, is making a lot of profits, abnormal profits. But now a potential entrant comes on the scene. Someone knows that the company or the producer A is making abnormal profits and wishes to start up to get some of those profits, to, to take away some of those profits for him or herself. Now the threat of competition as a barrier to entry may now operate as follows. Producer A simply makes a phone call to the potential entrant and threatens to reduce the price, perhaps below the average variable cost. So the potential the, the, the producer, the existing producer, calls the potential potential entrant and says, If you set up, I will wait till you have spent all your money on the, the premises, the machinery, the offices, and when you've set it all up, I will then cut the price. Perhaps even below the average variable cost, because they have reserves, let's say, to enable them to do it. Well, that means that the company, the potential entrant, will not be able to sell. It's not a nice thing to do. It may stop the potential entrant from investing in the business. But it is bully tactics, and it's not nice. But uh, the threat of competition may lead to this type of behaviour. It may not be exactly the scenario as I've given there. They may not make a phone call and threaten someone. They may just uh, put the word around the market that they're thinking of cutting the price. Um, so they just may flag it up so that the word gets back to the potential entrant and thereby kills off the idea. So it's a barrier to entry. There are also natural monopolies and economies of scale mergers. Large firms may benefit from economies of scale uh, and this reduces the long run average cost. Uh, it may make it difficult for new entrants to set up because of that. So when companies start, they normally start quite small. But as they grow, they're able to benefit from the division of labour, specialisation within the plant. But eventually, they get start to get bigger and bigger, and they're able to get specialist machinery, specially built for them, which is even more productive. But they're also able to attract specialist staff. Uh, they're able to uh, conduct research into the market. They're able to research and develop the product and bring out innovations for the product. Be able to establish their reputation and their brand through advertising. And the banks are willing to lend money to them, lend capital to them, uh, at cheaper rates because the, the banks see them as good companies. So all of this means that their average cost is falling. Um, it will eventually start to rise 
when we'll have diseconomies of scale. Now diseconomies of scale is when companies get too big. They get too big and it's difficult to control the companies and the companies have to be broken up because it's difficult for management to try and keep control over the business. That's when we call diseconomies of scale. It becomes bureaucratic and difficult to, to manage. A natural monopoly occurs when a firm can serve the market at a lower price as compared to a competitive market. So when there is competition, the price is forced down through the, the force of competition. Companies trying to get sales will reduce the price. But a natural monopoly is one where a company simply by virtue of its location or by virtue of its uh, uh, its knowledge of the market or its knowledge of the product or its knowledge of the technology that's required to service the market um, that company is known as a natural monopoly so that um, it's able to outcompete even the most competitive firm well in that case uh, the natural monopoly will be a barrier to entry there's no point in potential entrants in attempting to enter to produce that product because the natural monopoly will be much cheaper and will obviously be able to fight off the competition from the new entrants. The most efficient uh, may be may to organize uh, the market is by having one firm only so the most efficient way to organize the market is by having one firm only and recognizing that that is a natural monopoly and there's nothing anyone can do about it it's the best way to serve the market is have that one firm because of its location because of its knowledge of the product because of its history because of its reputation it's all of these things plus more probably which gives that company a uniqueness. It gives it its ability to produce at a very efficient price and thereby of course blocking potential entrants. There are financial barriers as well. <coughs> Large and established firms have privileges when borrowing finance from the banks. I mentioned this earlier. Well, <coughs> Large companies have a good reputation uh, there are growing businesses, they have uh, reputation in the market, um, they perhaps have engaged in research and development, um, they, they're well established and, and the banks like that. So the banks will lend them capital at cheaper rates because there's less risk associated. At least that's what the banks believe. There is less risk in those companies. They are um, in a better position to pay off their debts according to the schedule that's agreed at the time of the loan. So uh, larger banks have an advantage, L sorry larger companies have an advantage in that situation. Small companies don't have the same pecuniary advantage. Small companies uh, will have to pay higher rates of interest. That's if they're lucky enough to get the loan in the first place they might be rejected because they're seen as too risky. Banks generally prefer to lend to larger companies. Now production and distribution. Well large companies are able to coordinate production through better use of the division of labor and specialist machinery. So large companies are able to uh, work out what they want to put in the market, what the demand from the market is and they're able to schedule their production accordingly, scaling it up or scaling it down as the need arises. So they have much more flexibility even though they're larger companies they're able to scale up their production or cut it back and they may be using specialist machines to do this, running the machines faster or for longer periods or slowing the, the work uh, flow down as the case uh, requires. They also have um, a better set of distribution channels and better market knowledge gained through experience. And that will block potential entrants as well. They, they may already have tied up the outlets 
They may have special agreement with the outlets only to sell their products. Or the outlets may place their products in a more prominent position within the shops or within the, the stores. So that potential entrants will be disadvantaged and that could be a barrier to entry. So in this video we've talked about various barriers to entry and mostly from the perspective of a small company starting up and trying to get a foothold in the market. Uh, some of the uh, discussion went on to talk about more general situations with uh, barriers to entry. But you can see the objective is to maintain abnormal profits where possible. Remembering that abnormal profits are just those profits over and above that necessary to keep the company in that line of production. So it's it's an excessive profit, it's over and above that required. But the companies will try to preserve that and the way they try to preserve it is by having barriers to entry. So that's all we're going to deal with in this video so let's leave it there and say thank you for watching.